As we've been looking at the subject of the 16 key Bible words that relate to God's salvation, uh, we know that people have lots of questions. And so I've asked my son Dave to uh, do a little research and find some of the most commonly asked questions about these topics. Uh, he's joined me today. We're going to have a little discussion about some of these subjects and we, we hope you'll find it helpful. So Dave, go ahead. Yes, uh, in your talk, you mentioned that some would say to foreknow means to forelove. Uh, why is it important to make a distinction between these two ideas? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And the reason why people make the link is because in the Old Testament, uh, the word to know sometimes has the idea of intimacy, as in Adam knew his wife. And so people dr jump to the conclusion that to foreknow could mean to for love. I think there are three reasons why that isn't true. Uh, first of all, because sometimes in the New Testament, the word to foreknow just can't mean that at all. Uh, we noticed in the video that there are a couple of occasions, both with Peter and with Paul, where they use the word in a common sense that people knew something before it happened, and it could have nothing to do with loving. Uh, I think the second reason is that the word yada, which is the word to know in the Old Testament, is never spoken of in some sort of advanced way. It has to do with knowing someone in the present. And so it's, I think it's a stretch to make uh, this Hebrew word to have something to do with uh, looking in, in advance. And I think the third reason is that we take the Bible in its plain and obvious sense, unless otherwise indicated, and so to take the word in its simplest meaning, unless somewhere in the scripture we have this added idea of loving having to do with foreknowledge. Um, another common question that comes with the topic of foreknowledge has to do with the idea of free choice. Uh, do people have the ability to choose if God already knows what's going to happen throughout all of time? Well, of course, we're dealing with really big ideas here, and the safest way is to think in Scripture. And one of the great things about the Bible is that it, truth flies on two wings. And so there are several passages, and there are many of them, but several passages really helpful because side by side it presents one verse with divine sovereignty and the next verse with human freedom or something like that. So let me give you a couple of those. Uh, first of all, the famous parable in Luke 15 where in verses 4 and 5 we read, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. So in the first case, the initiative is all on the part of the shepherd going after the sheep. But in the third part of the story, we have the, the prodigal in verses 17 and 18, and we read, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger, I will arise and go to my father. And so we have both pictures here, the seeking shepherd and the seeking sinner. Uh, in John 1, uh, famous verses in 11, 12, and 13, he came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. And the very next verse then says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So once again, no one's going to be saved if God doesn't take the initiative. The question is, with how many has he taken the initiative? And is it possible to respond to God when he stirs my heart? And these two passages link those together. 
and there are many others like them, but I'll just give you one more, a famous one in John chapter 10, where in verses 25 and 26, the Lord says, I told you, and you believe not the words, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not because you are not my sheep, as I said to you. And so the assumption is they couldn't hear him, they couldn't respond because they weren't his sheep. But towards the end of the chapter, in verses 37 and 38, he says, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe. And so there is the real possibility of those who are not his sheep becoming a sheep by simply believing. And so many such passages are there. The famous one in Romans 9 through 11, where at the beginning of the section it sounds like he's saying that uh, some he has mercy on and others he hardens, but if we read to the end of the section we discover he's concluded all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So the Bible is its own best interpreter. There's balance in the Bible and we read, need to read these verses in their context and they themselves will help us to understand this perfect balance. Something I enjoyed from uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, Mere Christianity is where he looks at uh, a mother and how she gives her children the option of keeping their bedroom tidy. And uh, it's her will that they learn to do this themselves. Now, when they take up uh, this challenge and instead opt out not to keep it clean, uh, a messy bedroom is not the mother's will, but it is her will that they have that choice. And so we get to see, as he points out, how uh, even though the outcome is not in the will of the mother, uh, the process of letting the children learn is her will. And we get to see that duality that we uh, see in the universe, that God uh, doesn't... Um, that uh, the things that happen in this world aren't consistent with God's will, uh, but giving man a choice is the will of God. Mm -hmm. Now, in the upcoming weeks, uh, you're planning on talking about election, predestination, uh, and adoption, as well as uh, the other uh, different gospel words. Um, now, without giving too much away, how does foreknowledge tie in with those three uh, ideas that I mentioned? Okay, well, that's, that's great. Uh, the first four words of the 16 all have to do with God's decrees really before the beginning of time. There are three great verses that are quite helpful in this regard because they link together some of these doctrines in the same sentence. So they show us the relationship between them. That's really helpful. So the first one is 1 Peter 1, 2, which says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So here we understand that God's choice to whatever purpose is linked to his knowing beforehand uh, certain things. And we're going to think a little bit about that and how it relates. But here we see quite clearly that God's election is based on his foreknowledge. And then secondly, in Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, we read, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons. So here, the predestination is with the objective of adoption or son placing. And then thirdly, in Romans 8, 29, For whom He foreknew, He also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. So uh, I wouldn't call myself a great artist, but I've brought along my little handy dandy uh, whiteboard here. And uh, maybe this, this little illustration is helpful. Um, so we have the subject of foreknowledge, this idea that uh, from eternity to eternity, God, God's foreknowledge is really linked with his omniscience. 
And uh, uh, because we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God, I've put election here. And uh, the idea is that God, for his own reasons, and we'll, uh, we'll see what that, those are, um, that he chooses certain groups or individuals based on his foreknowledge. And to what purpose, I think we're going to see that in the study. And then we have this idea of predestination. The foreknowledge is linked to predestination. And so if we put the word pre over here, and then destiny over here, uh, the fact is that predestination um, is before time, and the destiny is after time, but it's linked, again, to God's foreknowledge. And then as we noticed that God's predestiny is to adoption, and so this idea of adoption is taking us from our position now in a fallen state, saving us by God's grace, and then elevating us to a position of sonship and heirship uh, once we've received our glorified bodies and are able to take on responsibilities in the family business. So these four ideas are all clearly linked with these three verses. And I think as we read through them, we'll see that the Trinity is involved in these verses, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in accomplishing his purposes. Yeah, that graphic is really helpful in those verses that really show how those uh, biblical ideas are tied together in the Word, uh, and it really gets you excited for the upcoming movies. Um, if you like the video, go ahead and uh, like it, share it, uh, leave a comment or some questions uh, for upcoming videos. <laughs>